Can you remember, before I went on annual leave, can you remember I last preached from the book of James? Who can remember that? It may be a long time ago. Okay, who remembers dancing to uh, Billy Ocean? See? You're meant to remember the word of God, not the CD. The title was, Going Gets Tough, the Tough Get. And it was from James. And I said, I believe we might end up looking throughout the whole letter of James. And that appears to be the case. So the next few times it looks like I'm going to be preaching, we're going to be looking at the letter of James. So, James uh, was the leader of the Jerusalem church. Also, he was the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, The letter is meant for the Jewish Christians who have now living among uh, the Gentile nations because of the persecution as recorded in Acts 8. By the way, that was God's plan. Ultimately, God used that to actually get the gospel out of Jerusalem. Just thought I'd mention that in passing. So what sometimes looks like it's a really bad time, actually God's doing something behind the scenes. And sometimes it is to shake us out of our comfort zones. It was written, anyway, somewhere between 40 and 50 AD, more likely around about late 40s AD. And if you read the letter and you read then the Beatitudes, you know, in Matthew's chapter 5 to 8, the Sermon on the Mount, you will see some parallels. You will see some background teaching in that. That's just the backdrop of James. Can you remember what we learned last time? Now you've remembered Billy Ocean and uh, an 80s uh, DVD. Can you remember what we learned? Anyone? Okay, see now I haven't got the time, I'll move on. Taking trials as an opportunity to mature in Christ. Is this starting to ring some bells, I hope? Treating trials as pure joy. Because you know that actually at the other end of it, there'll be something new within you, a new growth. New maturity, a new growth. This is what James is saying. And also, unfortunately, trials and temptations we can use as an excuse to act out our own evil desires. Oh, you don't know the problems I'm going through. This is why I can get away with doing this. We can use our own trials and temptations as an excuse to fall away and to do our own thing for a while. James is saying, nope, that's not valid. God God understands our grace, understands that we do do that, and asks us to come back. Podical Son's a good story of that. But neither less, trials and temptations shouldn't be an excuse. So with this in mind, we need to look at what James has to say in regards to holiness and righteousness now in the next few verses. So if you can turn with me to James chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Yeah, I'm going to say this. For the next few times that we are going through um, the chapters, James, you'll note, has something to say about the mouth, the tongue, words. Have you ever seen, read the book or seen the movie Inkheart? Inkheart. You haven't. You should do. Inkheart, it's a very, very, um, I've read the book prior to, uh, if you've not seen it, the movie stars Brendan Fraser, not that I'm saying it's brilliant, but it closely links. What's the key thing is, the key character in that, when he reads books, he's known as the silver tongue. When he reads books, he brings characters to life. It's random, he doesn't expect it. Things materialise, characters, events, exercises. Words are very important. Something actually happens. Now, it's a reality, it's a fantasy show, I grant you that. I don't expect anybody now to be reading a book and to suddenly bring things to life, okay? But there's something about words we forget actually does something real. Our God, when he spoke, created that to which we're living in now, yes? When our God says something, sometimes it says, it's going to happen. The Lord has spoken, it's already happened. It's going to become. I think we sometimes forget that the words we speak actually do become reality. I mean, they don't create things in the material sense, but they do in the emotional and spiritual sense. They do create. You raise and praise somebody up, 
Watch them light up. Watch them remember that praise, that thank you. They come to you, that creates something in them. Unfortunately, the reverse, the other side is also true. Say something, one off remark at one moment, and look at the long term damage it could do. It could sit in that person as their living reality for life. I'm hoping also when you encourage someone, the same thing happens. So our words have something real about them. And James has a lot to say about the tongue. So, 19 to 21. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, fairly well known bit of the verse about being quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. When James is saying being quick to listen, it's about quick to listen to quality of speech, not so much quantity. One can speak, listen to a lot of speech. Majority of the time, it's complete rubbish. Normally, it's gossip in some form or another or whatever else. But it's actually about being quick to listen to the quality of what is being said. So hopefully now you're going to be quick to listen. Good. Good answer. So I thought it was quite appropriate when Chris was doing some of the stuff about speaking. It uh, resonated. But when I listened, read these three verses, one of the questions that popped to my mind, quick to listen to who? Slow to speak to who? Slow to get angry with who? Now, I bet you, like me, normally when you read those, you immediately always think of, A, another person. But I think there's two other possibilities. One is God. Can anybody guess the third? Thank you very much. Yourself. Can't be anybody else, really, unless you start getting your doctor do all you want to do animals. What do you mean by ourself? Well, let's just go. If you're going through trials or temptations, as what was happening in the beginning of chapter one, we could be slow to listen to God when we're going through it. We can be quick to speak into the situation. And we can also be very quick to be angry with God when we're going through it. Why is this happening to me? What have I done wrong? Do I not lead this group? Do I not do this at church? Do I not do this, 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 this? If we're going through trials or temptations and someone's really upset us, we can be slow to listen to the other person. We can be quick to speak and defend ourselves. And we can most certainly be very quick to be angry at them. If we're going through trials and temptations and we cave in, we can be slow to listen to what God says about us and his forgiveness and how much he loves us. We can be very quick to babble at ourselves and condemn ourselves. And we can be very quick to be angry and upset with ourselves and just keep going on and on and on about how stupid or foolish and there's no way back to God and I've done this all wrong and I might as well just collapse now on the floor. I might as well not call myself a Christian anymore. God can't use me for the rest of the day or the rest of the week. It's all over. We're very good at listening to that very quickly. And telling ourselves the case. Do 
James has an antidote. Be quick to listen properly. Actively listen to God first. Or the other person. Or listen rationally to yourself for a moment. Then consider rationally what you have heard and then speak on it, but slowly. Take your time. Then be slow to become angry. Now, the desire here is that hopefully by the time you've listened first properly, and then maybe if you decided I should speak now, hopefully the anger's already gone because you might have listened properly to the situation. You might have listened properly to the person. Listening is a problem we humans don't do very well at. Not listening properly. Not listening to actually what is being said. Ever been in an argument with anyone? After 16 years of marriage, I've never... No, sorry. After si- <laughs> But you ever been in an argument with anyone, be it your partner, be it a friend, a work colleague... Fellow brother or sister in Christ, church leader. I'm just throwing everything out there. Ever actually thought about listening carefully to what is being said? Bless you for your honesty. Sometimes we don't listen to what's being said. What we believe is being said is what we hear, not actually what is being said. So that then relates to, then we then speak rashly back, normally to defend ourselves or to attack. And we're angry because we haven't listened to what the person said in the first place. We've misunderstood them. Not because they're not speaking correctly, not because they're not speaking a language I can understand, It's because before they've even opened their mouths, I've already decided and projected onto them what they're going to say. So what they're saying is not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing my own internal, hmm. Now you're all going to sit there and say, no, 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 don't do that. Except for, the. I won't mention your name on camera, don't worry. Except for the honesty. Here, James is saying you should be quick to listen to the quality of what's being said, i.e. what is actually being said to you. In when uh, we do marriage preparation classes, it's the key subject. Listen to what your partner is saying, not what you think they're saying in an argument. Conflict always happens, that's obvious. But true blow-up arguments, real angry arguments, happens because actually you probably haven't actually listened to each other in the first place. And the same goes in any relationship you have with anybody of any kind, no matter what it is. You have to be quick to listen. Properly. Actually, dump your preconceptions of what you think somebody's going to say and hear them. Same goes with God. We can go in prayer to God with a whole baggage of stuff, or we want an answer to something, and we know what we really want to hear, and we're hoping that's what God's saying. We pray constantly. Oh, God's definitely said this. I I, I can sense that God is saying this to me, and we can keep doing it, but actually God might be saying, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying the complete opposite. Unblock your ears. Listen to me properly. I've got something far more exciting for you, but you've got such a narrow focus at the moment, that's where you're going with it. And that's the wrong path. Listen. Stop speaking. Listen. If we as humans listened properly, 
it will save a lot of arguments. Real dialogue can occur. And it's in the Bible, and we're meant to do what the Bible says. So, be quick to listen. And yes, right now, Joy is probably sitting there saying, good, I'll use that on him later. (laughs) But be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, note it's slow to become angry. James is not saying never become angry. Be slow. Slow, why? Well, quick, flash, light anger, real blue, like the touch paper type anger, or even slow, seething, unresolved anger, is actually out of man's selfish desires. It does not bring about the righteousness of God. And we're all going, yeah, we know that, but we need to practice it. But slow, considered anger, i.e., God, is this from you? Am I meant to be angry about an injustice or something that's going on, not with myself, but maybe with somebody else? If we look at, back to Andy Robertson's sermon last week, talking about justice and, you know, and what we should be doing, sometimes we are given a, a deep-bellied anger from God that says, this is wrong, I want you to actually go and do something about it. That's fine. But as it says in Numbers 14, the Lord is slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving inequity and transgression, but by no means clearing the guilty. The Lord is abounding in love, but he is slow to anger, does not mean he doesn't say, that's it, judgment's come. But it is slow. And I'm personally always very grateful for that. I hope you are as well. But flash talk, talk, touch, Blue touch paper type anger, the sieve th- that you just suddenly, that's it, I'm going to explode now. And shout at you and blow in your face and tell you you're, you're the ones who are in the wrong, not me. I've understood you clearly. And it's not until sometimes if you come down a few days later and you talk back to that person, that person comes and approaches you, you suddenly realize you didn't hear them right in the first place. And then you're humbly apologizing and saying sorry. But if you heard correctly in the first place, we wouldn't be in the boat. I know I'm banging on about it, and I'm not having a go at all, but we as Christians, we like to think we're all lovey-dovey. But let's be honest, we can be just as bad in here, and we can be just as bad out there. And people need to see something different in us, or else they won't know Christ. Come tomorrow, they're going to see something different in Wayne. Human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. James, don't forget, half-brother of Jesus, therefore he was Jewish. And when he's writing some of this, he might well have in his mind what the Jews called then the third tongue. And I'll try and explain this to you. Because when things are spoken in anger because you've not heard properly, it does three things. When you speak in anger because you've not heard properly, it does this thing. It damages the person speaking. Their reputation is damaged. Ever listen to a gossip? Do you, after a while, when you've listened to them sufficiently, you think, do you know something? They're going to talk about others like that to me. What are they saying about me? So it damages your view of uh, that person speaking, yeah? It also damages the person who's being spoken to. And I'll come to that in a moment and give you an example, or a hypothetical example. And it clearly damages, uh, damages the person that is being spoken about. The tongue, three things. Don't ever think for one moment that when it's just two people having a good old, nag about the other one down the road do you know what he did do you know what she did don't think for one moment it just remains between you two it has far reaching damage 
Oh, you may only talk to each other, but this is the hypothetical example. And it is hypothetical, okay? I'm not thinking about anybody whatsoever. If you feel challenged, it's God doing it, not me. So, this is hypothetical. The problem is this happens every day, day in, day out, everywhere. And this is the problem. So, say someone in a company, college, organisation, friendship group, and I'm going to say church, was deeply unhappy with a manager, leader, another mutual friend. Basically, they can't get their own way, for instance, because their motives are not of God. And because they haven't actually listened to God or others for that matter, they're just angry. They're always angry. So they start, and I'm going to use this phrase, and if you don't understand it, I'll pay it. But they start slagging off the other person. That's what it is. Don't train it as anything else. You start moaning about somebody else to somebody else and not the person you should be talking to, the person you're talking about. You're slagging them off. Strong term, but it's true. So you start doing that of your manager, the leader, other mutual friend or whatever of the organization or the friendship group. You start doing that or whoever does that. Not only for the person who's doing all this, the moaning, they're actually reinforcing their own anger. They're actually believing their own mouth about the other person or organization. And the person that they're speaking to is listening to all this. And don't think they just dump it and forget about it and walk away. It sits in. I told you, remember us about words are very powerful? They manifest something in someone eventually, in their way of thinking. When it says in the Bible, be uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind. The more you read the Bible, the more your pathways are transformed and you think more clearly, godly about how your life should be, the same happens if you just keep listening to somebody doing this about an organization or about another person. Eventually, your mind starts thinking about that other person. And what happens, it gives you a skewed view of the organization or the other person. It might upset your relationship with that organization or with that other person. The person that you've that's received the anger in their ears, they might start looking at that other person who was being spoken about and then go, yeah, I actually know some truth about you. I know what you're saying, but I know what so-and-so said. But actually what so-and-so said turns out is not true. It's just their own anger talking out because they've not got their own way. Or whatever. I'm just trying to give a hypothetical. And it skews up your view of that person. So whenever that person now speaks, and that could be really good talking, it could be a good manager telling you how good you are, or, or you know, um, a mutual friend saying how much they love you, and you're going, hmm, what are you after? And, to be honest with you, sometimes within Christian circles, sometimes this can go on in the ear and the person receiving it actually starts having a skewed view of church, then have a skewed view of Jesus, and then decide it's all hypocritical and walk away. Words are very powerful. This is not the righteous life that God desires. So James says here, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Don't let it happen. Don't let it get to you. Don't you become like this. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. And even slower to become angry. So I'm going to ask a question. And it's one I expect a response back from. Unusual for me to do this. But how do you stop someone who's starting to maybe have a bit of a, a go at your ear? Somebody at work 
or friends. How do you stop that? Sometimes I say, you know, I'm really sorry, but um, the scripture talks about gossip, and I really don't want to have this conversation. Thank you. Talk about something else. Talk about something else. Thank you, Marcy. Anybody else? Kevin. Gossip is usually a, a trade. You give me this juicy bit of something and I'll give you something else. Now, if you've got nothing to offer in return, people rapidly lose interest and go away. Yeah, that's the passive way of dealing with it. Thank you. Anybody else? Whoa, uh, Say sorry, I'm not in a position to judge anyone. Because I don't know. I don't know them, so I cannot say anything about it. I'm not, I cannot judge that person. Okay, not in a position to judge anyone? I always give them the classic, if, who, let who is without sin cast the first stone, you know? Yeah. It shuts them up right away. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? I usually take the side of the person they're talking about. So that usually ends a conversation. Thank you, Lorraine. Well done. I would say I just don't want to listen. I don't want to hear about somebody else at all. Thank you. Pastor David. So can I stop you there? Before you go any further, have you actually had this conversation with the person you're talking about? Absolutely. It says it in Matthew 18. You've got a problem with your brother or sister? You go to them. So it's quite right. If you're just going to start doing this, I'm hoping the other person will turn around to you and say, have you had this conversation with the other one? Well, no, then don't talk to me. Matthew 18 says... And if you're not sure, it's in the Bible. James also says here that you should humbly accept the word that is planted in you, which can save you. Now, we can skip over that because we look at this whole slow to speak, uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, and then sort of skip over the bit that says, which can save you. Humbly accept the word that's in you. That can save you. So listen. We'll come to that in a moment. Which is here in the next few verses. 22 to 25. Do not merely listen to the word. Like now. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what it is heard, but, it, but doing it, he will, be, he will be blessed in what he does now it's really frustrating me because it's the niv and it also means women as well not just about the blokes verse 22 do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves do what it says this must be the heart cry to every godly christian in the world since they dot don't just listen do it. It's about right way of living. When you're listening or reading the word, in our case, it's doing it. When you do this, what it says here to do, that's part of your relationship with God. And it's the heart cry. Don't just listen. Actually do it. We always listen sometimes to how we should do something. We might read the Beatitudes and go, yes, I know I should be 
blessed as a peacemaker. Oh, I know that. Then be a peacemaker. It says, love your enemies. Do it then. Love your enemies. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, I know I should do that. Who's my neighbor? Funny enough, person next door. It's very interesting. We do like listening and unpacking who neighbor is. And um, we sort of, and it's very good when we discuss l- loving thy neighbor and we go, neighbor's everybody, everybody you come across. And he goes, yes, it's everybody I come across. Somehow we sometimes might forget we do literally mean the neighbor. Our neighbors much need to hear the gospel just as much as we do, as much as your work colleague does. Your neighbor actually needs to hear about it more. Yeah, but you, pfft, my neighbor hears my arguments through the wall. They hear me shouting. Yeah, it doesn't mean, not expect to be perfect. You can explain why you're like that. It's called honesty. Jesus accepts us for who we are. Changes as time goes on. But actually listen to the word and do not deceive yourself. It must be put into practice. Do you know I know how to drive a car? I may humbly say better than most. But. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not traveling down that road. Um, but boom, thank you. I won't be here next week. Um, yes, well. Um, but I know how to drive a car. I could read the manual, the highway code, the whole lot. But unless I actually get in the car, turn the engine on, and start driving off, don't go nowhere. You can discuss it all day long. Clutch control, turning the steering wheel. But unless you go and do it, nothing's going to happen, is it? You're not going to move forward, are you? Or backwards, depends on which gear you got it in. The same goes with reading this, the Bible. It's no good just listening or reading it. You've got to do it or you're not going to move on. So, I just want to point something else. In verse 24, in the NIV, you'll see that it says, well, start from 23. Anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, is like a man or a woman who looks at their face in a mirror, and after looking at oneself, goes away and immediately forgets what they look like. That and in the NIV is not the best translation. Because it gives the impression that uh, if you, the way the grammar's done, that it's, just, it's because you've looked at it and after you've walked away, sort of the and, you then completely forget what you look like. It's not a very good translation of that because the NLT does it much better and the the NLT does it much better because it gives the understanding and it's much different. And I'm trying to unpack this. Anybody looks in the mirror? Okay. Nobody, some of you don't. Wow. That's amazing. I look in the mirror occasionally. And the way this and bit translates itself it looks like and you're looking for something if you intently look at this you deceive yourselves anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at the face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like it's like like the and bit and you're looking and you're looking for something in the mirror you're looking for something intently in the mirror you're looking for an imperfection if you drop the and if you just simply say Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face. After looking at himself, he goes away. The and gives an impression sometimes that you're and you're definitely looking for something in your face. Who looks in the mirror and looks at their face a lot? You might well be looking for lines. No, you've given up with that, Carol. Okay. You might be looking for greys. That's why I cut my hair short now, makes them less obvious. When you look in the mirror, you might be looking for zits. Ugh, did you just say that word? But for some reason, normally when we look in the mirror, we're looking for something initially, something wrong with us. 
Yeah, you're checking for what? You're checking that something's wrong, Carol. Yeah, we're looking for imp imperfection, Jess. No? So why are you looking in the mirror then? Think about it. Why are you looking in the mirror? Sorry? You like what you see, Vera. So, so, so you don't do anything then. You don't put any makeup on to think, oh, I need to cover that up. Or anything like, no? I'm being sunny. Be honest with yourselves. I bet you, first and foremost, you look in the mirror to go, is the hair out of place? Yeah? I don't have to worry about that too much these days. We do look for imperfections. The first thing we look for in a mirror is an imperfection. And this is the impression this can give when you read this. We need to find something wrong. We might look at us and go, gosh, there's a spot I haven't popped yet. I need to spot, pop that. You're going to remember this sermon, trust me. Yeah, I don't care. And actually, by using this example with this, this, this whole looking at the, intently at the word of God and relating that to you looking for imperfections, what you think is that when you read the Bible, the first thing you've got to do is read it to find fault in yourself. And that's not what's being said here. It's not about finding a fault. The Bible's primary purpose is not to find fault in you. Its primary purpose is to help you grow in Christ. Not to find a fault, but for you to develop a relationship. For you to know what God wants you to do today. Not what to correct, what he wants you to do, what you are doing. So what James is saying here, somebody who looks in the mirror goes, must find my imperfections, and then walks away. I bet you don't forget your imperfections. You think, oh gosh, I hope nobody notices that today. What well, the, the NLT makes it very clear that actually, sometimes when we look in the face, do you memorize your face? Do you try and remember exactly what your face looks like? So when you walk out, you've got a strong impression of what your face looks like, yeah? No? Nobody does that. No, you sort of look, sorted, thank you very much, and walk away, yeah? And forget about it. James is saying that's exactly what you do with the Bible if you're not a doer of it. You read it, you listen to it, but you literally treat it like your face. It's not something you bother to remember. So it makes no transformation, doesn't guide you for the day, it doesn't do any of that. This is what it means about um, looking in the mirror and then just walking away. You don't bother to try and memorize the Bible, i.e. help it to transform your life. You might do your daily reading of your Bible. And you're saying, I've done my duty. I've checked my Bible, like checking my face. I walk away. I don't need to read it anymore. I don't need to help it transform my life. I've just got used to it. It's just there. But as he says in verse 21, but accept the word planted in you. Make it become reality. Because why? It saves you. The primary purpose of the Bible is not a manual for salvation. That's done in Jesus but it helps you to know how to live. Not find fault, not to pull you down to find fault. So you should learn to ingest it, want to read it, want to live by it, quite literally, yeah? Because it saves you. It helps you on a daily basis. It saves you having arguments when you listen to it when it says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. It would make your day a lot smoother, wouldn't it? Who knows that a parachute saves you if you jump out of an aeroplane? So you'll want to learn how it works, wouldn't you? Oh, hang on, you're right. So you'd read the instructions. And so you'd make sure you'd be wearing it all the time if you were in an aeroplane, wouldn't you? And as you have to jump out, maybe, what would you do? You yank the cord as the instructions tell you, yeah? And then you land safely, yeah? 
The Bible saves considerably more than your body jumping out of an airplane. Yet why do we sometimes just ignore it? And I'm speaking to myself at times. Be doers of it. Don't just listen to it. Be doers of it. Make it become a living reality of your life. This is what James is saying. And he's also saying, don't deceive yourselves. There are people that read it and think, I'm saved. I've done my bit for the day. I've read the Bible. I've done my godly bit for the day. And so they believe they're saved. They've deceived themselves. Now, this is where I have to be very cautious. Because it's very easy now to, now to hear the bit that, oh, if you don't read your Bible today, you're not saved. That's not what it's saying. What James is clearly noting here that, that people are reading scripture, Old Testament scripture, listening to the teaching of Jesus, but actually not doing anything else with it. They're part of the church, part of the gathering, but they're not actually living their life in any differently. It's not transforming them. It's making them, they're still angry people. They're still gossipers. They're still malicious talkers. It's not changing them. And he's saying, and they sit there and say, oh yes, I believe in Jesus, I'm saved. And James is saying, they've deceived themselves. Because they're not doers of the word. They have deceived themselves completely. Don't be like that. Isn't this a cheerful subject? But James does end it and says, but the person who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, notice that it's not to look for your imperfections, it's to give you freedom, and continues to do this, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And he continues in 26, 27, to which I've run out of time. If anyone considers himself religious and does not keep a tight rein on their tongue, they deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We're going to talk about the tongue more and more as we look at James. But it's quite right. If you can't keep a tight rein on your tongue, you might not want to look into that. And you might need to help somebody keep a tight rein on their tongue for them by saying, have you read Matthew chapter 18? By the way, when we say tongue, can we also read into that, please? Email, Twitter, Facebook, texting, and then any other multimedia item you can think of. A tongue can bring good and evil. First thing we know whether we're going to bring out good or evil is to be listening first. The religion, what God wants, is for us to look after those who here are seen as orphans and widows, those who are in distress, those who actually need help, those who need lifting out of the mire and the clay. I come back to what Andy Robertson was saying last week. That is part of what God wants. And it says, keep yourself from being polluted by the world. That does not mean keep yourself out of the world. We're just not meant to fall into the trap of the world. Office gossip is quite prevalent, isn't it? It was in my day when I was in the um, old offices. doesn't happen here anymore. Pastor Dave is up that end and I'm down this end. No. But 
Office golf, he always used to do the rounds. We're asked to not engage in it, but we're not asked to back out of it. We're asked to be salt and light in it and maybe to challenge it. What was spoken earlier, Wayne is going to be salt and light tomorrow. He's going into the world. He won't be polluted by it. He's going to be in it. It's not talking about withdrawing. It's talking about being in it, not being polluted by it. Some Christians think, oh, I must pull out of that. We're asked to be in the world. We're asked to go and be sort of like in the coffee shops. Maybe with people who we wouldn't normally associate with. But we're asked to be there. We'll continue with this uh, next week when we look at chapter two. And I'm hoping it's going to be um, slightly more cheerful. Do you want to take a moment to actually take note of the opening line, which is be quick to listen? So could you just now be quick to listen to God for yourself? Pray. Be quick to listen to God. Father, I pray for each and every one of us that we will be people who are quick to listen properly, slow to speak, and even slower to become angry. Father, I pray that we are people that when we read your word, we recognize it brings freedom. Not to point out our faults, but to release us into life with you. Help each and every one of us, Lord, live out your word on a daily basis. And note not to deceive ourselves. Help us, Father, by your spirit and by your son we pray. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.